for one. High in that graceful branch yonder, just under the largest maple leaf, there hides a nest. Look, do you see the leaf rise in the wind? There, there she is, that little gray bird. All day long the bough rocks up and down, to and fro, and all night long the stars peep through the leaves at her, and the tender moonlight sheds a golden rain around. Through all the long summer the sweet wind hovers, now singing a song of peace and love, and home and joy, now lifting the green canopy overhead, to give the little mother a view of some soft cloud floating in the blue sea above, and so she sits and broods and broods. And when it rains, why, it never rains at all, in that sheltered nest, the leaves look out for that. Watch, dipping, swooping, curving, with a flutter and a whirl, comes a wee bird, smaller than the other, and she has yellow feathers in her wings. But mother bird's eye are on her, and wondering, she anxiously awaits the result of this unexpected visit. The small visitor hops about with a saucy air, eyeing all the time the neat and comfortable nest. Suddenly she makes a dart at a dainty bit of white cotton, deftly woven into the nest, and as quickly carries away the pride and joy of the young mother bird's heart. It was as if, when you had just finished a nice little home, with bay windows, porches, cornices, and had sat down to your sewing to enjoy it all, someone had come and quickly picked off and carried away the bay windows, porches, and pretty things, leaving your house bare and forlorn. Yes, that bit of cotton was a bay window, a porch, a cornice, and all the other beautifying things to the little bird's heart. So also thought Yellow Wings, or she would never have made such a bold attempt to steal in broad daylight. With a cry of dismay, Mother Bird darted after her, but too late, alas. Yellow Wings was fleet and wary. She knew the quickest way to get out of sight, and poor little Mother Bird must come back to her dismantled home to tell her husband the sorrowful tale, and they too repair the damage as best they can. It is not the work of a day, though, for such bits of cotton are not always to be found for the looking. Poor little birds, and two watchers standing by, saw it all. One was, did you ever know the little girl that lived in the pretty house, with a garden all about it? Her eyes were bits of blue, left over when the sky was finished. Her hair was like curling sunbeams, and her lips all kisses and rose leaves. When she laughed, twas like the spring wind playing amongst the violets, so low and sweet. Every one loved little Esther, and she was queen of the whole house. There she stood on the balcony, close over the branch where Madame Bird rocked all day, and saw the deed done which so darkened the cheer of the little nest. Her heart swelled with indignation that a bird could be so naughty, and her feelings took voice in a sorrowful, horrified, Oh, poor, poor birdie! The other watcher stood below, leaning on his rake. He was a dark-browned young man, with a face that would have been good, but for the settled look of gloom and scorn which he wore. There was a certain pride, too, such as did not match the rough gardener's suit. All about him stretched the broad lawns, smooth as velvet, of the Carlton home, and above the blue, blue heavens. It was a perfect day, and yet the perfection jarred on the young man. Here was all this beauty, and none of it for him. If there was a God, how could he treat him so? Where was the justice in it? He looked down with contempt at the heavy boots and the rake which must be used, and used faithfully for someone else, ere he could have a right to his daily bread. He hated the work he was doing, and put no pleasure in the clean-cut curves of the gravel paths on which he was working, or the well-shaped mounds he was preparing for the plants that were soon to fill them. It was not many years since he was a boy, in a home, where everything was pleasant and happy. He was the pride of his father, and the pet of his mother, their only child, and his every wish was gratified if possible. His father had not been rich, only comfortably off but he had never wanted for anything. He had been a bright boy in his classes in the public school. His father had intended to educate him for a lawyer. To that end, the boy was not expected to devote himself to anything but study. So he grew up with very little practical knowledge of any kind. He had not improved his opportunities for study as well as he might have done, 
but he did not realize that yet. At fifteen he was in a fair way to graduate from the high school in one more year, when his education suddenly stopped. The father was killed in a railroad accident, and the little mother, not very strong at the time, never left her bed after the funeral, and in a few short days was lying beside her husband. When the poor, stunned boy tried to look around him to see what he should do, they told him that he had no money, and must leave school and go to work. The indulgent father, who had never been able to deny his son any wish, who had always granted any request of money from his wife, so that she had no idea he was not able to spare it, had not made allowance for the death angel, and his possible summons to the court of heaven. The money had been spent as it was earned, on little everyday comforts, and there was nothing left to the boy but hard work, for which he was not in the least prepared. He had taken, as a matter of necessity, the place that was offered to him, but he did not know how to do the work well, and disliked it. When there came an opportunity for a change, he changed, and, as is often the case when people try to better themselves, he only made himself worse off, and hated the new work more than the old. So he went from one thing to another, often out of employment, and so surly and haughty in his manner that no one cared to employ him. He awoke one day to the fact that he was a man, twenty-four years old, with no regular employment, and, what was worse, no chance of any work whatever. He had drifted in these years, far away from the old home, where he might have friends to help him. He found himself in this strange city, having spent two weeks in fruitless hunting for something to do, in debt to the landlady of his miserable little boarding-house for his board for those two weeks. What was to be done? There seemed to be nothing in the world for him to do. He had even condescended to ask one man if he didn't want his wood sawed, but had received a sharp no, that he had not the courage to ask anyone else. So when he heard Mr. Carleton inquiring for a man to do a little gardening for him, as his gardener was sick, he was glad in a sullen kind of way to accept the offered work. This was his first day at the place, and he had filled his mind with hard, bitter thoughts about himself, his lot, and the injustice of his God to have allowed it all to happen to him. You see, it never occurred to this young man that he had brought part of the trouble on himself. His mother had been a Christian, in her quiet way, always teaching him that he ought to love God, although he had not in any very definite idea why. Just before she died, she had said to him in a broken whisper, Robert, I haven't been the sort of mother I ought to have been. I haven't told you about Jesus and his love. I don't know what I should do without him now. You must know him, my son, and get ready to die. You will be sure to come to me in heaven, my boy. He had kissed her and promised, too stunned to know what he was saying almost. But later, when his grief had somewhat worn away, he had fallen in with companions who ridiculed his mother's God, and he had grown to think that if there was a God who loved him, he never would have let so much trouble come to him. So the promise to his mother had been set down as a foolish one, made to quiet a dying woman, and the boy grew into manhood, trying to make himself believe that he never expected to see his father and mother again. So, with his mind full of gloomy thoughts, he worked, looked across the lawn and saw the beauty, but took none of it into his soul. As he heard the flutter and twitter above his head, he looked up and saw the little robber bird in the act of stealing the coveted cotton. He scowled at the bird, then told himself it was the way of all the world, and that birds might as well bear it as men. He had thought he was alone until little Esther's troubled voice startled him. He looked up at the balcony where she stood, great sorrowful blue eyes full of tears, watching the distant flutter of wings. He gazed wonderingly up at her until the eyes came back to the nest. Then she caught sight of him. She looked at him a moment, perhaps a trifle surprised, to see a stranger there. Then she said, still with that horror in her voice, "'Did you know there were any such naughty birdies?' The young man almost laughed, but the little face above him was so grave that he only answered, "'Why, I don't know. Why shouldn't there be?' "'But birdies were made to be good and pretty and sing for God.' He had nothing ready to say to such an astonishing reply as this, but the little maiden went on. 
Poor little birdie! I wish I could do something for her. Now her nest is all torn to pieces. You might get her another piece of cotton, he suggested. She was delighted. Could I? she said, her face all changed in an instant. Oh, could I? And would she use it? I think she would if you hung it on the branch close to her nest, said he. Then I will ask my grandma for some. And if I come down there, will you lift me up so I can put it on the branch? Because I'm not very tall, you know she said quaintly. The little maiden received the promise, and vanished through the open window, leaving Robert Knight with the first real smile on his face that had been there in many a day. Presently she came down the wide piazza, and stood beside him on the ground. "'Here I am,' she said, "'and I have some cotton and some silk ravelings from my dolly's sash, pink and blue. Do you think the birdies would like those too? My grandma thought so.' the sweet voice asked his opinion as if it were a matter of great import and the young man smiled again as he assured her he thought madame bird would be very glad to get them a great time they had arranging them on the branch father bird high up in the branches of the neighbouring elm with his heart in his mouth watched them wondering if there was going to be an utter destruction of the pretty home he and his wife had laboured so hard to make but perhaps Madame Bird saw the pinks and blues and coveted them, for she went and sat very still beside her husband, looking down first out of one eye and then out of the other. A dainty little maiden mounted on the shoulder of a dark young man, one white arm and hand clasped close about the collar of the dark, rough coat, made a pretty picture, with the maple boughs for a background. They worked eagerly, fixing them, so the Britty would be sure to see them the first thing and not feel bad any more, Esther said, and when it was done they withdrew to the shadow of a large cedar to watch for the return of the householder. After eyeing long and anxiously, Madame Bird's love for the beautiful overcame her nervous fears, and she came by various short stages, stopping long at each place, to be sure all was well, to the branch where hung the ravelings of Dolly's sash. She pecked at them once or twice, turned her head to one side, gave a twittering call to her husband, and down he came. Busy and happy they were then, as any two birds could be, weaving in and out the delicate threads, and making such a nest as would make the heart of yellow wings ache with jealousy for many a day. Oh, how happy was little Esther, down behind the cedar tree, her small hands clasped together with delight her eyes very large and bright with excitement. Robert Knight stood near, silently watching her. Presently he remembered that his time was not his own, to stand thus and idle away the hours, watching this beautiful little creature. He turned with a scowl and was about to go back to his work, but Esther looked at him with a smile. "'I think you must be a very nice man,' she said. He started. When had any one ever called him nice since his mother used to lay her white hands on his curls and call him her nice boy? It brought a queer sensation to his throat, but he mastered it and said in a rather gruff voice, Why? Because you wanted to help the poor little birdie so much. Then she put that soft little hand in his, looked up into his face and smiled again. May I stay with you a while? she went on. What are you doing? I won't bother. Of course he said yes. How could he help it? No one ever said no to her when she asked like that. End of chapter 1